Well, it's been terrific to enjoy the kids' talks that Neil's been putting together. Uh, today, I want to thank the Whitemans for their effort, uh, their Lego Masters, and it's been great to see what they've been able to do with Neil to bring the Word of God alive in a way that's understandable for every age group. So I want to thank uh, Brent and Elizabeth and their kids working with Neil uh, for the way in which they've put the kids' talk together this morning. Uh, you've already heard God's Word read, the passage that we're looking at today, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 34. I'm not going to reread it. Uh, it's there on your screen or it's in the service sheet you printed off. Uh, you can follow it at home in your pew Bibles. The sermon outline is there under uh, the passage and you can follow along there and take notes if you've printed off the sermon sheet. There's a comments box at the bottom of this page and you can fill in any comments there and send them to Neil and myself and we'll try to respond to you as quickly as we can. I've really been enjoying reading a biography of J.R.R. Tolkien. I've really enjoyed reading his trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, and his little book, The Hobbit, with my children. I have fond memories of my father reading them to me. Uh, in both those books, he paints a picture of a huge and immense world called Middle Earth. Uh, the thing that I'm starting to realise as I read this biography is that this whole world is actually the backstory to his development of a new language. Put simply, he created a whole new language. And to make sense of that language, he then created a massive series of stories that painted a backstory, an explanatory story for this language. The backstory is crucial for understanding the new language he created. I think the irony of the backstory is that it's actually become the main event and we've forgotten the language, but that's another story. To understand what Matthew is doing here in this passage today, we need to get the backstory. What's the explanatory account that helps us understand these three double miracles that we have in front of us? As we dive into that, let me lead us in prayer and then we're going to spend some time in the backstory so that we can understand these events in Jesus' life. Dear Father, thank you for Matthew, an outsider who was brought in, a sinner who was forgiven, a man who'd been dehumanised, made wholly human again. Thank you that you took him from being a tax collector to being the writer of your gospel. Father, thank you that we can read it today. Please bring us face to face with Jesus as he is and convict us of our need for him. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, unlike Tolkien, uh, the backstory for what we're dealing with here in Matthew's gospel is very simple. It's the backstory of sin. Sin, as we've said time and time again, is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Let me say that again. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Sin is the universal human condition in this world. Every human being is sinful. Now, it's a bold assertion in this day and age. It's a bold assertion at any time, isn't it? And I don't have the time to map out the defence of such a statement. However, that's the diagnosis of God himself, places like Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, and it's a statement that accords with the facts of our own existence, our own knowledge of history. Well, what does sin do? Sin deludes humans. Sin is the lie that a human can be more than they are. Instead of being the image bearer of God, Humans are led to believe that they can be God. Just listen again to the lie that brought sin into the world in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Sin not only deludes humans about who they are, it also deludes humans about who God is. It persuades humans that God doesn't have their best interests at heart, that God isn't generous or loving but stingy and grasping, and we can do a better job than God. Sin disobeys. It leads humans to turn away from God's word and design, 
to create their own world. Listen again to the original question of the devil to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? In deluding humans into thinking that they can do a better job than God, it leads humans to disobey God, to disobey his very clear word, to disobey his very clear design and plan. Sin deviates in deluding humans, in leading humans to disobedience. Sin deviates. It it turns the world on its head. Listen to how Eve considers the fruit that she had been forbidden to eat in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. The very thing that was forbidden is now regarded as desirable. The very thing that was off limits is now seen as incredibly accessible. The very thing that is described as leading to death is now seen as needed for life. And the whole order of creation deviates. Sin deviates. It leads away from God. It leads away into the human alternatives to God. Sin degrades. Have you ever noticed that sin never creates? Sin just takes what's already been made and breaks it down. Sin's never positive, it's always negative. Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. A very open and transparent relationship between Adam and Eve is now degraded to be one of covering and shame. It's extended even further under the judgment of God in the rest of Genesis 3, where the very fibre of the world is now damaged. The relationship between man and woman is now damaged. The whole of creation now moves towards death and not towards life. This leads to the fact that sin destroys. God warned of such a consequence in Genesis 2 verse 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you'll certainly die. To be deluded into thinking that God was mean and stingy, to be deluded into thinking that you could do a better job than God, to actively disobey God, to deviate from his clear and true word, to submit to the degradation of that delusion, well, it only leads to the destruction of death. It removes humans from right relationship with the author of life. And when that happens, the consequence is only death. It leads to the opposite of what God created. And God created the world so that his image bearers could rest with him and now it has destroyed the relationship between God and his image bearers. It's destroyed the very fabric of creation. It's destroyed the rest that humans were made for and so now we are restless as we constantly seek for meaning and purpose, fulfilment and satisfaction. In that sense, all sin dehumanises. Now that could be the summary description of sin. Sin dehumanises. It takes any human that sins and makes them less than human by deluding them into disobedience, by degrading them through deviation into destruction, All sin dehumanizes. It reduces humans from what they were designed to be because it makes us less than what we were created for to reflect God to the world. Our sole purpose in life now is to reflect ourselves onto the world, isn't it? This truth applies to all humans because all humans sin. The very fact of universal death testifies to that truth, doesn't it? And we know this truth personally, don't we? We know this truth in our persistent ailments, in our damaging illnesses, in our broken relationships, 
in the hurt caused to us and caused by us through lies and slurs and angry words and distant silences. The way in which we can feel ostracised and alienated, overwhelmed and isolated, lonely. And God commits to doing what he has said. He brings the very judgment of death. He talks about in Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17. He brings that judgment of death to sin and sinners just as he promised. But at that very same moment, God commits to being just and merciful. He comes and finds Adam and Eve. He comes to give them the opportunity to talk to him about what they've done. He removes them from the presence of eternal sin as he removes them from the garden. He provides for them in his judgment, clothing them. And then God commits through the family of the childless and idol-worshipping Abraham to deal with the sin of the whole world, to roll back its dehumanising impact and to bring his approval, his blessing again. I think at times like this in Matthew's gospel, in any gospel, we need to remind ourselves of that backstory of sin so that we can understand what Matthew wants us to grasp. The backstory drives everything that Matthew writes here because he wants us, his readers, to know the commitment that God had made has come good. Remember the very first verse of Matthew's good news about Jesus? Remember the way in which Jesus' birth is described in Matthew 1, 21. You will call him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Remember the way in which we've seen the identity of Jesus revealed as he has worked, as he's preached, as he's taught, as he's healed. Remember that we've seen of Jesus in his identity as the preacher and the teacher, the healer, the saviour, the Lord, the God in the flesh, the one with the power to put right the natural, the supernatural and the whole human as Matthew draws this section of miracles of Jesus at work to a close, we would do well to remember that backstory, wouldn't we? So that we can see what Jesus is doing here in these final miracles. Last week, in a wonderful image, we saw Jesus as the good doctor. I'm at point two on the outline. The good doctor come to deal with our universal human sickness of sin. Here's the fulfilment of God's commitment to deal with human sin and it blows all of our man-made structures out of the water. And now in these final three miracles, these little short vignettes, we see the good doctor in action. As the scene showing Jesus as the good doctor closes, the next section kicks off. Look at Matthew chapter, chapter 9, verse 18. As he was telling them these things, Suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him, saying, My daughter is near death, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. This approach by the leader of the local Jewish synagogue, and that's what we presume leader means, opens up another set of three miracles. The three miracle events are all doubles. In each are either two people or two problems dealt with by Jesus. Two women at opposite ends of life, two men blind in life, a man struck down by two problems in life. In each instance, the people afflicted are people who are completely marginalised from society, even removed from human society, completely beyond all current physical aid. The young daughter is dead. It's the most marginalised you can be from human society. The farthest from physical aid that anyone can be to be dead. The older woman has had period bleeding for 12 years, an affliction beyond the healing hand of any doctor, which had rendered her unclean in society and so removed her from all human relationship. The two blind men were suffering an ailment that left them in the dark, physically and socially. And the final man, the man with no ability to speak, who had become a housing allotment for a demon, well, he was beyond any aid and beyond any human society as he lived in spiritual darkness. Uh, in an obvious way, all of these people are dehumanised. They are images of what it means to be totally and sharply affected by sin. Their affliction shows in an obvious way the dehumanising consequences of sin, human sin in this world. And the bookends of the section draw this out. There's nothing more dehumanising than death, is there? 
and the affliction of dumbness removes the key human faculty through which we exercise our ability to rule the world under God, our voices, our ability to name. Moreover, both of them show the debilitating damage of sin. One is dead and one has the residence of a demon inside him. The woman bleeding is removed from all society, regarded as totally unacceptable because she is unclean. And the two blind men cannot operate in human society in the way they were designed. Now, I I don't want you to hear me wrongly. I'm not saying that these afflictions make these people less than or that they are less human than you or I. What I am saying is that these people are indicative, examples, if you like, of what happens to every human being through sin. We are made less than what God designed us to be. We are dehumanised as sin deludes and degrades and destroys our humanity. As we strive to be God instead of God, we become less than what we are made to be. And these five people show this in a particularly sharp way. In each of these moments, there is faith. That's a word that we can often use in our circles and even in our world. Uh, Sometimes it's used in a magical sense as a kind of cosmic key that seems to be used to unlock something special. Sometimes it's used in a way that's general. You just need it and things will go well. Uh, Sometimes it's derided as being brainless or foolish. Well, None of those meanings are connected with the word faith in the Bible. A rough definition of faith is taking God at his word and living like it. Taking God at his word and living like it. A faith has a direction, an object, God. Uh, It's established on evidence and substance, the words of God seen in day-to-day human existence, and it creates a response. It changes lives as people live in light of God and what he has done and what he has revealed. All of those aspects are here, aren't they? The leader in the local community displays faith. Look at verse 18. As he was telling them these things, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him saying, My daughter is near death, but come and lay your hand on her and she'll live. We're still in the area of Jesus' home base, Capernaum. This man has obviously heard of Jesus, perhaps even watched Jesus, listened to Jesus. He lives in light of what's been displayed and revealed. Uh, It's a remarkable statement of faith. Jesus, you only have to touch her and she will be completely alive. The bleeding woman displays faith. Look at verse 21. For she said to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be made well. She's obviously heard of Jesus, even as she's been isolated from society. Perhaps she's even seen him from a distance and she acts, however dangerously in the society that's rejected her, she acts based on what she has seen and heard. The two blind men identified Jesus. Look there in verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, shouting, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men approached him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can do this? Yes, Lord, they answered him. Confronted by Jesus' question, they're quick to state their faith. They call him Lord. They acknowledge his kingly role. They desire deeply for this authority to work for them. Uh, They've understood what the Old Testament prophets have said about the blind being made to see when God's promised one comes. They've heard of him. They've listened to him. They take him at his word and they live like it. And whilst those who bring the demon-possessed dumb man to Jesus obviously displayed faith that's not mentioned It's the reaction of the Pharisees at this point, which is the faith or lack of faith moment. Look there at verse 34. But the Pharisee said he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. They've heard everything that Jesus has said. They've obviously observed the goodness of his impact. They know the events that surround him and they dismiss it completely. And they live in light of that rejection. They regard him as the enemy of all humanity. The faith aspect of these scenes shows the way in which these people are connected to Jesus as the good doctor. In this instance, where there is faith in Jesus, then Jesus displays that he can deal with their dehumanised state. Put simply, the doctor restores people 
to whole humanity. The doctor can restore people to whole humanity. In the case of death, Jesus brings life. In the case of unclean social isolation, Jesus brings healing and restoration into community. In the case of blindness that isolates, Jesus brings sight and inclusion. In the case of demon possession that leads to dumbness, Jesus asserts his authority and restores that key human faculty. In each instance, we're confronted by the one who can do these things. And he's worthy of the trust invested in him as he displays that he can. It's important to note that in each of these instances of faith, the faith is expressed as Jesus can do this work, not that he must do this work because I have faith in him. That's important for our understanding of so much about relating to Jesus, from areas like prayer through to physical healing. It's important for our understanding And we can explore those areas later on. But it means at least this. Real faith trusts that Jesus can do this. It does not demand that he must do this. It does not treat faith as a bargaining chip or a magic key or a special way of gaining access. Faith is an expression that we trust that Jesus can. His is the decision to act. And the backstory of sin held up behind these events helps us to see what Matthew is revealing at this point. This is the good doctor at work, restoring humans broken by sin, dehumanised to whole humanity. Let me say that again. This is the good doctor at work, restoring humans broken by sin, dehumanised to whole humanity. Matthew has flagged this truth from the very beginning, hasn't he? From that first verse through the genealogy into what the angel says to Joseph in Matthew 1.21. The backstory is there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.20 as Jesus says he's come to fulfill God's commitment. The backstory of human sin is there right throughout this section of Jesus at work. Now in that sense, these three miracles form a bookend with the three miracles that kick the section off in Matthew 8.1-17. A climax to the portrayal of Jesus at work before he teaches what it means to follow him. A Frederick Dale Brunner makes this comment in his commentary on Matthew chapters 1 to 12. Quote, in chapter 8, Jesus reaches out. In chapter 9, Jesus reaches down. In chapter 8, he embraces those whom nobody else would touch. In chapter 9, he rescues those whom nobody else could touch. The picture of Jesus at work is unavoidably clear. He's the one promised by God to deal with human sin and its consequences. He is willing to bring outsiders in, and he is the only one who can bring those outsiders in, restoring humans to their whole humanity. He is the one promised by God to deal with human sin. Just as Tolkien's backstory, I'm at point three on the outline, just as Tolkien's backstory helped him understand his invented language, so the backstory of human sin here helps us grasp the key lessons about Jesus as we finish this small section of Jesus at work. The identity of Jesus is clear. He is the one who will, the only one who can, deal with human sin. Matthew wants us to see the good doctor at work. Jesus is the one who's come to deal with the dehumanising effect of sin by dealing with sin itself. And again, as the gospel progresses, we'll see more and more of what that means and where it climaxes. But at this point, Matthew wants us to know this. Jesus is the one promised by God who can, who can deal with human sin. The work of Jesus Well, he deals with human sin in making people whole again, making them wholly human. I think as we see the consequences of sin on these people, they are dehumanised, aren't they? Just like all of us by sin. They're removed from community just like we are from community with God. We're meant to see that Jesus can make people fully human again. On the one hand, his his miracles are just physical. 
Uh, on the other hand, they, they display what Jesus can do. He can make people whole again because he's come to deal with the root cause, which is sin, which means we've got to respond to him. We've got to think about the nature of our response. Let, let me finish by drawing our attention to what I think Matthew desires at this point. He wants to present Jesus at work so that we work out our reaction to Jesus at work. And one response is very clear. It's the response of faith in the leader, in the woman with bleeding. We see a very clear statement about being connected to Jesus through faith. If you hear Jesus, if you see Jesus, if you take him at his word and live like it, that's how you're connected to him. Remember Matthew chapter 5, 10 and 11 from last year? To have faith in Jesus is to acknowledge that he can deal with our dehumanized natures, our natures damaged by sin. It's to come to him with complete trust and life displaying that complete trust to submit to him as the Lord and the Saviour. To come to Jesus in such a way is to acknowledge the backstory of your own sin, our sin is to accept that only he can make us truly human as image bearers of God. If you've not met Jesus like this, let me plead with you to come and meet him, to deal with him, to see him, to be restored. If you have met Jesus like this, if you've seen him and heard him and trust him and live like it, then let me encourage you. He has dealt with your sin. He's humanized you. He's dealt with your greatest problem and there is wonderful restoration in the very fibre of your being because the good doctor has come. There's another realm of faith reactions to Jesus. I think it's captured there in the blind man and the Pharisees. Both of these reactions are a flawed faith reaction. The blind men show the failure to have faith expressed in obedience. It's to trust in Jesus, to call him Lord, to accept the good stuff from him, but then not to obey his lordship. The Pharisees show the wicked nature of rejecting Jesus, the anti-faith response. I mean, how, how in any way could you regard the healing of a demon-possessed dumb man who can now talk and is free from oppression? How can you call out of the devil? Not only that, but consider the ramifications of accusing the one who's come to deal with sin and saying that he's actually in coalition with the one who causes sin. It just beggars belief. But there's a warning there. There's a warning there for those who would dismiss Jesus outright or who would take the good parts of Jesus and reject the obedience that comes with him being the Lord. As we move into the next big teaching chunk from Jesus, this much is clear. First, Matthew wants us to meet Jesus at work as he is. The preacher, the teacher, the saviour, the Lord, God in the flesh, the good doctor, who's come to deal with sin and make us whole again. And second, what do you make of that? Let me pray. Father, thank you that we can see Jesus at work. Uh, it's always wonderful to see a master craftsman. Uh, here, you, here we see the perfect human at work. And thank you that as he works as the good doctor, he works to make us whole again. Father, in our brokenness and in our pain, in our afflictions and ailments, in perhaps our loneliness and isolation, Bring us to Jesus so that he can rehumanize us and make us whole again. Amen.